Let me give you a little bit of background. This started back in 1997. It ended uh, eight years later in 2005, but the significance of this project I think will continue for many years to come. Basically what happened was that there was an obvious issue that young earth creationists had not addressed having to do with the age of the earth. One of the most important pieces of evidence that is used by evolutionists and old earthers is the radioisotope decay products. Where did they come from? If you measure the rate at which radioactive material decays today, such as uranium turning into lead, various other radioisotopes, uh, carbon-14, for example, uh, the rate at which it decays and the amount that is around would indicate that the Earth has been here millions or billions of years. And yet, young Earth creationists say that can't be because the Bible says that the Earth is young. So that was the standard uh, explanation, just referring back to Scripture, which is a good argument, but it was not satisfying to most scientists, and it was not really satisfying even to Christians because they began to say, is that really true? And so... Um, about 14 years ago, or 17 years ago, the Institute for Creation Research had a board meeting in which they were, one of our board members said, you know, we need to really address this issue. We haven't responded to that in a scientific way. And uh, nobody seemed to be willing to step up to the bat and uh, take that problem on. Now, one of the reasons that that was the case is that individual uh, creationists had tried to do that and many of them had kind of had a uh, crisis in their faith because they couldn't solve the problem. And many young earth creationists had kind of given up on young earth creationism, and many of us were afraid to even touch it. Well, one of the things that we had not done was as a group try to solve this problem together. So I stepped, I stepped up to the bat and I told the board that I would try to organize a group of scientists to address this issue. And one of, the thing, one of the other things that we had done for many years was to criticize the evolutionary model, but not try to solve any of the problems and offer an alternative to them from a scientific perspective. So this was kind of a new approach to this. We were actually going to do original basic research to try to address this issue. Now this became an issue because if we were unsuccessful, it was going to be extremely embarrassing to not only us as young earth creationists, but the Christian community as a whole. Because one of the things you need to do as a scientist is to be honest in your reporting. But science, the way it is supposed to be done, is that when you find a result, you're supposed to report it and be honest about what you found. And so when I recruited a number of people, there was eight people that you see the names on the board up here, uh, that I recruited to be involved in this project, we had committed on ourselves that we were going to report what we found, no matter what, even if it was embarrassing, even if it was a problem for young earth creationism. So the, the issue we were dealing with, is the earth really old? There are three basic assumptions in radioisotope dating. In fact, anything that you want to try to date something with has these essential assumptions. But particularly with the radioisotopes, a radioisotope, by the way, is an element that by breaking apart converts into another element and results in some decay products. So a radio, an isotope is a, is a there are a number of different elements that have slightly different characteristics, but a radioisotope is one of these that automatically, a few of them will break apart with time and decay, as it says. Um, one of the first assumptions is uh, of radioisotope dating, when you go out to try to use uh, radioisotopes to date something, is that there was no original concentration of a daughter element. Now, there's a parent element, such example would be uranium, and it decays and becomes lead. The lead is a daughter element. Now it turns out we're gonna talk about other elements that are formed. For example, helium is produced as well. That would also be a daughter element. So there's parent products and daughter products. Most of the dating is done by looking to see how much daughter element is there 
and how fast it occurred or how fast it developed. And from that, by measuring how much there is and how fast it appeared, you can estimate how old or how long this process has been going on and date the age of the Earth. The second assumption is that the constant uh, decay, the, the de decay rate has been constant with time. Now, most everybody has accepted that idea. In fact, most of the team <clears throat> on the rate project actually believed that. I believed it. I was taught that in school. I had no reason to believe otherwise. But we found out in this project, although we all assumed that that was the case, it turns out that it isn't. And it turns out that that is, in fact, one of the major reasons why radioisotope dating is not reliable. We were shocked at that. We were surprised at that. Finally, there is a third assumption, and that is that the radioisotope decay process occurs in a closed system. That is, when you have a parent element converting into a daughter element, none of, it is, none of the parent element is added or taken away, or the daughter element added or taken away, other than by the radioactive process itself. So you can be confident that no chemical processes or photoelectric processes or thieves break through and steal, taking away some of the products. That all is in a closed system, and you can use that to estimate the age of the Earth. Well, we were going to explore all of these issues. And so we had to set up some hypotheses. And what we did was we broke this project into two phases. There was a three-year initial phase called the preliminary phase, and then a five-year exploration phase. The first three years, we did literature search, we developed hypotheses, and tried to state what we were going to try to find or what we expected to find. And then the five-year project, we actually went out and did the research to try to find out what the answers were. The hypotheses that we started with were, first, that accelerated decay has occurred during creation, at the curse, and during the flood. In other words, accelerated decay. That if, in fact, the Earth is only 6,000 years old, and the process has been going on with all this material, there had to be some way in which it must have gone faster at some time in the past. How did that happen? So during that first three years, we talked about that, and we began to realize there had to be something called accelerated decay. So that this idea of a constant rate of decay must be, there must be something wrong with that. So we decided to hypothesize whether it was going to turn out to be true or not. We didn't know, but we hypothesized that there was such a thing as accelerated decay. Now, it doesn't mean we already found the answer. We only are stating the question, and then we had to either prove that or discount it. The second one was that some daughter elements may have actually been primordial. And in fact, you didn't start with zero amount at time zero, but there was actually some of those daughter elements there to start with. For example, uranium turning into lead, maybe there was a little bit of lead there to start with. We had no way of knowing, there was nobody there to tell you or to measure that, so we had to uh, at least uh, hypothesize the idea there may have been some that was primordial. Thirdly, uh, radio radioactive processes have produced evidence of accelerated decay. In other words, it isn't just enough to state it you have to be able to show it, and therefore the hypothesis would be in the field or in the geological column or when we go out and collect our samples of rocks, there must be some evidence of this. We can't just state it. We have to find evidence for it. So we began to collect data. That, that was the end of the first phase, and we reported this in a book that we published in the year 2000. It was called Radioisotopes in the Age of the, uh, Radioisotopes in the, Age of the Earth, a young earth creationist initiative. This was, we proposed the project with all the hypotheses and what we were going to do and what we hoped to be able to find. Then we started the five-year research. So our laboratory, and Bill Hoshu was our laboratory and field technician, we all got involved in collecting the samples, but Bill Hoshu got the lion's share of repairing the rocks, and it's kind of like a, a, a pharmacist mortar here, you'll see. That's a metal mortar and a pestle, but you use a, a giant sledgehammer to break these rocks apart to get the individual crystals in them and the individual elements broken apart so we can do the analysis. Uh, then we would have to separate these before we'd send them to the laboratory. 
So some of the materials we would put through sieves, different sized crystals would fall through the big sieves into the smaller one and then separate it out. So you could separate it into different types of crystals. Another way of doing this was to put the material that was broken apart in very finely uh, concentration, concentrated sizes into a heavy liquid. And some of these liquids were really dangerous to work with, but they had different densities so that some of the crystals that had a certain density would float to the top of that liquid and others would sink to the bottom. Then you'd use another different density liquid and you could separate them that way. And you'd run them through filters, <coughs> collect these samples, and then send them <coughs> to the laboratory for analysis. Now we had all kinds of analyses that had to be done. Okay, now I'm gonna report on four projects that had uh, separate results. And uh, there were other things that we did, but these were probably the critical ones that you need to know about. Okay, the first one was a project that uh, Dr. Russell Humphreys was responsible for, or the most uh, clear-cut numerical example that really was significant for us. This was the helium that was produced by uranium turning into lead. And this all came from granite. There you see these ro white rocks all along the road there. That's granite, or granodiorite it's called. And it's a white, whitish type hard rock that came from the melt. That rock was all melted at one time. When it hardened, it formed little black specks in it that is biotite. It's a type of mica, which is in layers. And inside of that are little bitty zircons. And the zircons contain uranium and lead inside of those little crystals. And they're like, they're, they're, they're in a, like a little prison. They're captured. They won't get out. By and that, analyzing those little zircons, and by the way, zircons is the same as zirconium silicate. At any rate, by analyzing those zircons for the uranium and the lead in there, we were able to determine that there was one and a half billion years on average of nuclear decay that occurred in those zircons, but by looking at the helium that was produced when the uranium turned to lead in those zircons, that is estimated to be somewhere between four and 8,000 years ago. In fact, there was an error bar involved in this so that the average value was about 6,000 years that these zircons converted uranium into lead. That's a familiar date, isn't it? That was amazing. We were surprised at that. Russ Humphreys couldn't believe it. Okay, let's get a little more detail here. These zircons that we find in the, in the biotite in the granite are really hard little crystals. In fact, they can go through a volcano which would melt most rocks, but these zircons have such a high melting point that they were not melted. They would go blown out the top of a volcano and be incorporated in the lava or other rocks, and those little zircons would still continue to exist, restraining the uranium and the lead inside there. So you had a closed system. Now these little uh, zircons are very small. Here's what they look like. That's a, that little bar down there above the word zircons is 100 microns, or that's one micron is one millionth of a meter. Um, 100 microns is about one, let's see, 1,000 microns is a millimeter. So 100 microns would be one-tenth of a millimeter. So that width is about one-tenth of a millimeter, which is about the length of a zircon. The, the diameter is about 10 microns. That's about the width of the diameter of a hair on your head. So those are very, very small crystals. And it took a lot of work to separate those out from the rock samples that we got. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the ways that we finally had to do this and to get enough of them, it took a lot of work. We actually had we actually hired a subcontractor to go in with tweezers and under a microscope pick out these little zircons to put them in a pile so we got the right size. And so there was a lot of hard work involved in this. Here's a photo micrograph of a zircon done by Mark Armitage, one of the associates of our project. So it's about 20 microns in diameter and it had flat faces on it. It's a very interesting type crystal. Okay, now each time a uranium atom decays and becomes, it converts into a lead atom, it goes through a decay chain. On the upper left there, let's see if I can point it. On the upper left you see uranium 238 and as it 
converts, it goes down to various elements through the nuclear decay to become lead, 207, and it produces a helium atom in eight steps as it goes down from uranium to lead. So in addition to uranium becoming um, lead, it also produces helium. Now this helium was the alternative way that we did to uh, estimate the age of these rocks. Okay, here's a uranium atom with all the electrons rotating around it, and the nucleus is throwing out a, a, a smaller particle, which is actually made up of two protons and two neutrons bound together without an electron. It, it produces these and it throws them out. That's the uranium decay. It throws out the nucleus of a helium atom because two neutrons and two protons, when it adds electrons, becomes helium. So inside of our rock, in our zircon, which is embedded in the biotite, embedded in the granite, is helium, which then has to escape out through the rock. So we've got all this helium that's a slowly escaping into our atmosphere. Now there's quite a history behind that, and that's why as an atmospheric scientist I got involved in this, trying to figure out why there wasn't more helium in the Earth's atmosphere if the Earth was billions of years old. It turns out the helium is still in the rocks. So when we went down and we found samples of rock, Dr. Baumgartner, who was at Los Alamos National Lab at the time, had access to some corings that were done as far as 12,000 feet down in the Earth they were looking for steam that they could make uh, generate uh, electrical power with. They were able to give us some cores from this, that, in which uh, in granite cores, which we were able to uh, analyze for the amount uh, for the temperatures and the amount of helium that was still in the rock. Here you see a sam five samples at different depths. This is in meters. That'd be about. Uh, <clears throat> 3,000 feet down, about 6,000 feet down, a little more than about 9,000 feet, uh, and so on. At those depths, the temperature in, 100, in degrees centigrade is a little over 100 degrees. That's about the boiling point of water at 3,000 feet down, all the way to almost 300 degrees centigrade, which I forget what it is, but it's much hotter than boiling point of water. The amount of helium that was in the rock was dependent upon how hot the temperature was. Down at the very bottom where the temperature was the hottest, there was only one-tenth of one percent of the helium still there that would have decayed in one and a half billion years. Up near the top, there was still 58 percent of the helium still in the rock. So the helium that we were looking for is still in the rock even today, and it depends on the temperature. The hotter the temperature, the faster the helium will diffuse out of the rock. Now why is that important? Well, it turns out that when you put a graph together like this, which I won't spend a lot of time on, it turns out that the hotter the temperature, in this case the hot temperature is to the left, here is the hottest temperature, 500 degrees, here's about the boiling point of water, a measure of how fast the helium escapes from the rock, called diffusivity, goes up at higher temperatures. And this tells us and there's a way to be able to estimate how old the Earth is from this for how much helium is still left in the rock. It turns out that if the Earth is four and a half billion years old, or the rock is one and a half billion years old, which, we est which is the conventional idea, the uniformitarian model would have a very low diffusivity. If the Earth is young, it would be up here five orders of magnitude higher. In other words, the helium would have had to have diffused out um, about 100,000 times faster than it would have if the Earth is old. So what is the actual diffusivity? This was the model that we estimated, and so we then wanted to take a sample, send it to the lab, and see what the actual diffusivity was. Turns out nobody had ever measured that. Nobody had ever tried to see how fast helium diffuses out of rock. Well, when we sent it to the laboratory, and I have to tell you a little side story here, we sent it to a laboratory in Pasadena, California, at uh, Cal State, uh, no, not Cal State, at uh, Caltech, Caltech uh, 
to one of the world's leading experts on measuring diffusion of gases out of rocks, but we didn't tell him who sent it to him. We sent it through a mining company. Because if we had sent it to him directly, he would have refused to do it. He wouldn't have had anything to do with creationists. Now, that's not deceptive because mining companies do this all the time because they don't want people to know where they're doing the mining to find out the minerals that they're getting. So it's a standard practice. We asked this mining company who had some friends of ours in it, and they sent it to the lab. He did all the work, published it, put it in the journals, and sent us the results. And then later, when he found out what he had done, he was quite upset at us, as you can imagine. But what he found was that the diffus diffusivity matched our creation model exactly. In fact, Dr. Humphrey said he had never done any research project that had resulted in a result that was so accurate uh, to that degree of, of confirmation. Well, so what we did was that we essentially developed an alternative to the uranium lead clock. And here's how it works. If you had two sand dials, the one on the left is uranium converting into lead with a little uh, valve. You got the uranium at the top and the lead at the bottom with a little valve in between that is adjustable, that little valve there. And over on the right side is our helium clock, which is an alternative to the uranium. If we turn that valve there on the left and the uranium starts to turn into lead at an accelerated rate, which is what we were proposing, it's producing helium at an exaggerated rate or at a high rate. But in going into the sand clock over there, it turns out that the diffus diffusivity was not affected by this change in the nuclear decay rate. It's a whole different system. So the helium began to build up in the rock. In this case, it shows it stayed in the top of the sand dial and was falling through at the same rate we have today. Then sometime later, that valve was closed off and it came back to the same rate that it was going on before. You find all this lead in the bottom of the sand dial indicating that the Earth is billions of years old. But yet, if you go over and you look at the helium in that lower sand dial, since it was continuing to accumulate at the normal rate, not at an accelerated rate, then you find that this process would indicate that the Earth is very young. And when you look at it, the uranium lead deal gives one and a half billion years for this process. And over on the right side, where we had the helium clock, it shows it to be 6,000 years. Plus or minus 2,000 years was the result of this project. So we developed an alternative clock for estimating the age of the Earth, which agrees with Scripture, by the way. That was the whole point of this thing. 6,000 years versus 1.5 billion years. That's a big difference. This one's the easiest to understand and is really significant. Dr. John Baumgartner was the primary principal investigator on this project. <clears throat> carbon-14 is an isotope of carbon-12. It turns out that carbon-14, when it's formed, is radioactive. Carbon-12 practically never decays, but carbon-14 does. In fact, it has a half-life of uh, almost 6,000 years, 5,700 years to be exact. That is half of the carbon-14 that we find in our atmosphere, which is where you find the carbon-14, decays to carbon-12 in 5,700 years. That means that in about 50,000 years at most, all the carbon-14 would have disappeared in the atmosphere. Now, we still have carbon-14 in our atmosphere today. So where did it come from and how did this process occur? Well, let me show you. Uh, we were looking at bones, um, dinosaur bones, various kinds of bones, coal, which is compressed and solidified organic material. Coal is thought to be 100 million years old. And people have thought, well, there can't be any carbon-14 in coal. People have looked for it for a long time, and they never found any until about 20 years ago, a new instrument was built called a radio spectrometer, which had the ability to measure extremely small quantities of carbon-14. And they started finding carbon-14 in coal. Now, how could that be if the coal is 100 million years old? All the carbon-14 that was collected by the plants into the coal would have all decayed to carbon-12. You shouldn't find any. 
Well, it turns out, we didn't discover this until we were a couple of years into our project, that it had been reported in the standard literature that they had been finding it. But the conventional scientific community couldn't believe it. They thought there must be some mistake in their instrument. It's contaminated in some way. So there was actually 70 scientific articles in the literature reporting on carbon-14 and coal saying they can't be there. There's something wrong with our instruments. Well, we found this out and decided this may be a good example of, or a good uh, project to work on for our age of the earth issue. Here's an example of a radio ice, uh, spectrom spectrometer. Here's how carbon-14 is formed in the atmosphere. You have carbon-12 in the atmosphere, and you have a little bitty bit of carbon-14. The carbon-14 is formed when cosmic radiation hits nitrogen in the atmosphere, nitrogen-14 molecule, breaks it apart, and it forms a carbon-14 atom and a nitrogen-14 atom. So it's a very small amount, but it's measurable in the atmosphere. This carbon-14 then is incorporated in the plants that grow on the Earth, and the cows and that eat the plants, incorporate that carbon-14 that comes from the plants. We eat the cows, and we get carbon-14 in it. We have a balance between our bodies, the plants, and the atmosphere. They have about the same ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12. But when the plant or the animal dies, here's a dead cow for you, the carbon-14 continues, continues to decay and becomes carbon-12, and with time, you have less and less carbon-14. By measuring the ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12 in a dead animal or a piece of wood or a dinosaur bone or coal, you can estimate how long that animal has been dead or formed. Well, if there is carbon-14 decaying during the flood, it was in the trees from the atmosphere the flood came along and buried all the trees and the plants and the animals. And the carbon-14 that was in there has been decaying since that time. We should be able to estimate how long it's been since the flood occurred based on the amount of carbon-14 that's in that dead material. Now that we have this instrument that can measure very small quantities of carbon-14. Well, it turns out when we do that, we estimate, first of all, this is the 70 papers that were published. I won't go into the details here. For, this is not a, well, I, I just won't go into the details. This was the 70 papers that we uh, plotted. We did our own experiment. Dr. Austin had access to coal from the coal laboratory, the federal government's coal laboratory at uh, Penn State University, and we did the same thing with 10 samples throughout the depth of the coal column and found basically the same result. But by and large, the coal that was there gave an estimate, oh, wait a minute, let me don't do this yet, it gave an estimate that the coal would be about 50,000 years old at the most. Not 100 million years old, but 50,000. That's a much smaller quantity. But in addition to that, if you take into account that the, all the organic material was buried by the flood and it changed the concentration of carbon-14 in the atmosphere, that would have affected it by about a factor of five or more. So that brings down the age of the Earth to about 10,000 years or less, just based on the amount of carbon-14 that's in coal. Now, one of the first criticisms that's going to come along is, well, coal possibly is contaminated. It's in a layer under the earth. Water is percolating down from storms through the ground, and it can bring down recent or current concentrations of carbon-14 into the coal layer that's below and contaminate that coal layer. So maybe that's where that carbon-14 is coming from. Well, Dr. Baumgartner then had a brilliant idea. He says, well, let's look at diamonds. Diamonds are all made out of carbon, but they are the hardest substance known to man they cannot be contaminated by rain or any other material getting inside the diamond. So let's take some diamonds and crush them up and see what we find. Well, it took us a year or two to get this process down because we found a lab up in Canada that was willing to do the process, but you had to melt the diamonds first. And so the temperatures had to be thousands of degrees. And they ground up the diamonds into diamond dust and put it in their oven to melt it. But the diamonds kept exploding. They kept blowing up their furnace. 
finally, after a year or two of trial, they finally got the process down. We're able to get the diamond dust vaporized and through the spectrometer, and they were able to measure the amount of carbon-14 in diamonds. And it came out almost exactly the same way coal did. There is carbon-14 in diamonds, and diamonds are on the order of 10,000 years or less in age. Now that really flies in the face of truth uh, to the secular community because diamonds are thought to be on the order of a billion years old, coming from down deep in the earth and being a billion years old, and yet they got carbon-14 in them. So they have to be young now based on these measurements too. Now, uh, here's our diamond where it has all the carbon-14 in it, and you see inside the diamond, the carbon-14 is converting to nitrogen-14. And so the ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12 is changing, indicating that this is how we're able to measure the age of the diamond. And it's not affected by external processes. Okay, I want to give you a few references here to some materials. Um, first of all, <clears throat> the second and final report for this project was called Radioisotopes and the Age of the Earth, a Young Earth, the Results of a Young Earth Research Initiative. That was published in 2005. It's almost 600 pages of highly technical material. Those are all sold out now. We had about 5,000 copies of that. They weigh about four pounds each. They make a great doorstop. Only scientists and engineers would want to read one of those. Uh, it's still available on the internet. Uh, we're all sold out and they're not going to be reprinted, but you can, if you're really into it, you can go on the internet and find them available at Amazon.com. The more popular version, Thousands Not Billions, the book by Don DeYoung, which kind of summarizes those results in a paperback about 140 pages long. There's also a, a DVD called Thousands Not Billions that you see all the scientists themselves talking about these results, and that's the result of the rate project. Thank you.